All right, welcome to Pixelated Audio, a podcast focusing on game audio, its history, and the people behind it. We're your hosts, I'm Brian, this is Gene, and today we're doing a special episode, which is our Library of Congress talk that we held just a, about a week and a half ago. Yeah, we came back a little while ago. You may have heard our last episode where we talked with some of our friends about our experiences, a little bit more of a low-key expansion pack style show. But this is the actual talk that we gave with some modifications. So we have inserted some of the tracks that we used directly from the recording and a few that we've added in post so you can hear the music a little bit better. Right. Some of them just made more sense uh, to throw in uh, after the fact because, you know, we're recording the audio through their PA and it just it sounds a little bit odd. But overall, I think the talk went really well and um, it was was different from like a normal show right because I, I mean obviously it's live but the challenging thing for us was kind of putting together something that was both historical and um, kind of fact driven but also something that was interesting and left room for more exploration as we get further into the, the talk. Yeah, we spent a lot of time early on coming up with ideas for what our talk should be about but what we ended up deciding on was putting it into a larger historical context. And, you know, a lot of times on the show, we talk about the history of a, a game company or a system or whatnot. But we really talked about pretty much gaming within the development of like the last 50 years. And as you'll hear, we, we draw comparisons to film and what was going on in the music industry at the time and technology in general. So it's a little bit of a broader focus than what we normally talk about, but it's still not super far off. So it's, you know, it's a lot of the same kind of stuff you've probably heard. Right, right. And I think too, um, we were asked by the concert director to kind of ten, to kind of lean more on the, the history side, maybe kind of like a, a general look at game history over the you know last 50 years we do go through a lot of really great information and we hope you enjoy the show as much as we enjoyed putting it together and recording it yeah and we'll be back after the talk is finished to talk about some of our closing thoughts good evening everybody uh, my name is david plyler i'm with the music division at the library of congress and i'm really excited to have you here for this exciting series of events that we're going to have and by that i mean both the events tonight and the events that continue tomorrow um uh, it's my privilege to, to introduce uh, the two members of Pixelated Audio who have an amazing podcast that you should check out, um, Brian Mosley and Gene Drayband. Um, they're here to give us a talk about kind of a brief history. They're going to hit every single game ever made. <laughs> that's what I've, In 30 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I've been told, so that's our expectation. You know, contractually, um, but no, in just <laughs> um, But we're really pleased to have them here, and they're going to be joining us uh, later in the event that we're having in the Coolidge. So you'll get to hear more from them at that time. Um, so please welcome Pixelated Audio. Thank you. All right, I'm Brian, and this is Gene of Pixelated Audio. Hello. We are from the San Francisco Bay Area, and we're here to talk about the evolution of game audio over the last 50 years or so. Uh, because of time, we are not gonna do a comprehensive look at game audio history. But we've put together a few points to illustrate the progression of game audio, focusing more on the milestones. And really, until recently, a lot of people considered game audio, um, especially outside of context, nerdy or kind of strange to listen to. But over the last 25 years, 25 years or so, uh, the appreciation and support for game audio and game music have been rapidly growing. And seeing that happen in front of us is something pretty incredible. So what is pixelated audio? It's a video game music podcast with a historical and preservation focus. Uh, we focus on discovering and highlighting game music throughout history, past and present. And it's kind of like a platform for composers and game designers, developers to share their stories and uh, share specific memories from development or something that happened during that specific time. So you're wondering why a podcast about video game music? Well, for one, games are a lot of fun and great games with great music are even better. There's so many amazing games with great music coming out today and a rich history of games that have already come out and there's more coming out every day. And as Brian mentioned, we get to be part of a large and growing community of people that love and share their love of video game music. Fun fact, Brian and I actually met because of MAGFest, which some of you might be familiar with. It's an organization that puts on music, video game music events throughout the entire US and they're actually based in Baltimore. All right, so what makes games and their music so special? Well, games are distinct from a lot of other popular media, right? So 
And that really boils down to the interactivity and the experience while you're playing the game. The interactive elements are distinct and um, they're engaging. They provide some kind of experience that's hard to recreate in other forms of media. Another thing here is that many of the biggest developments in game history happened within recent history. So just, I mean, some of you may remember a time before games even existed, right? <laughs> and uh, some of you might remember things when, you know, uh, I don't know, Minecraft was the new thing. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a diverse crowd and it's fairly recent history. But just like any form of media, games and their music develop due to changes in technology. But only few of those are intrinsically linked to the evolution of computers as games, which probably couldn't exist otherwise. So we're at a point in time where games are extremely expressive. They can range from really small to these huge, expansive worlds. But like, like we said, it wasn't that long ago and games were pretty basic. And to illustrate just how amazing all this progress has been within our lifetimes, we're actually going to go back to an earlier example of film, which dates back to the 1870s. So in 1878, we had the uh, photography experiment where Edward Boyd Bridge was asked to see if a horse ever lifts all of its feet off the ground at the same time. He set up a line of cameras set off by trip wires, and we basically have the first ever motion photography. Oh, you skipped, I think you skipped to... Uh... No, it's, I okay. think that's it. Can you see the gift there? Yeah. Okay. Hey, it worked. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> We're not seeing the same thing over there. So uh, that's really the beginning. In uh, 1888, we have the Round Hay Garden scene, which is the first surviving film actually shot on camera. And that's this right here. In uh, 1895, Edison and William Dixon recorded their experimental sound film, which was their opportunity to try to synchronize audio with video. The synchronization wasn't that accurate, but it was a huge leap forward. Again, in 1895, we have a silent film, but this is Baby's Lunch, which was the first time the public actually got to see a film in the world. They, they actually paid for the privilege to see this at around $15 today. This is my favorite slide. The $15 and it's like a minute, a minute watching a baby eat food. <laughs> it's, it's like a trailer. It's, that's so awesome. <laughs> 15 bucks. So in 1902, we have a trip to the moon. Some of you might recognize this scene, which is the rocket sticking out of the moon's <laughs> eye. Very recently, there was a restored version of this film that looked like this in color. But this isn't actually really a color film because they hand painted all of the frames one by one. Beautiful, amazing, but not scalable. <laughs> In 1908, we have A Visit to the Seaside, which uses alternating red and green colors to produce this color effect. Still not quite there. 1917, we're still using red and green, but films shot at the same time. We're starting to get a little bit closer. Finally, 10, 10 years later, in 1927, we have The Jazz Singer, which is black and white, but you can see the film quality has improved quite a bit. Not only that, full movie, synchronized sound, 90 minutes long. So pretty close to what we recognize as modern film today. And then here we are in 1932, Flowers and Trees. It's a Disney animated short. It's about eight minutes long, but we have sound, color, everything's together, finally. <laughs> so if we look back at that, that entire time, it took us 54 years to get from motion photography to full color, sound, synchronized, everything together. So why is all that important? Why do we bring this up? Well, a lot of that early film history has been lost or taken for granted. There, these kinds of opportunities do not come around very often. And we're at a point in time where games are still within recent memory. And we've developed to a point where we can actually start to capture some of that history. And many of the people that were involved in this process are still alive today. And that's why we at Pixelated Audio love what we do. Yeah. All right, so with that, uh, let's start with this slide. We wanted to start with a slide because we get questions and statements like this a lot, and I'm sure um, if you like game audio and you, you know, tell your friends, they might ask you some of these. First of all, game audio, no, it didn't start with Super Mario Brothers. Um, certainly a breakthrough, but that happened much later in time. It also still isn't just bleeps and bloops. Yeah, you still have some nostalgic soundtracks today, but game music has definitely gone way, way beyond that at this point. Yeah, and another one here is game music isn't really a music genre. Although a lot of early soundtracks were limited by um, 
sound hardware and technical limitations, the music could range so widely in style between that the only thing they had in common was that they were in games. So we'd like to kind of maybe say that it's more close to um, a category of music, something like film music. And finally, game music is absolutely real music. It may have started out very, very simple, but as time has gone on, and as you'll hear later tonight, we have some really talented composers that have joined, some that write for film. It has become an art form in and of itself, and some of the best game music can stand on its own outside of the context of games. So just, just like the early days of film that Gene was talking about earlier, there was a period of games uh, where they didn't have any sound at all. We do want to bring, bring those up just quickly. So we go back to 1947. We have what's considered the first electronic game, uh, the cathode ray tube amusement device. Very catchy name. Uh, it was never sold commercially, but it was you were able to control a laser beam on a screen. You have Tennis for Two, which was played on an oscilloscope with paddle controllers. And we move on to 1972, the Magnavox Odyssey, the first video game console, but it didn't have any sound. So all of these are huge milestones in game history, but we're here to talk about audio, and it takes a bit of a different piece of hardware in the 1970s to get there. Yeah, so we want to kind of start in the arcades where everything started blossoming, and the scene and video games were just really starting to come alive, and people could get their hands on them. Um, so starting with the early 70s. Yeah, so the early 1970s is an interesting time for digital technology. Pocket calculators were starting to become a thing. You could buy one for the price of a used car. Yeah. Uh, and not a cheap one, necessarily. Yeah, so many things were happening you know, really close together. And it's hard to pinpoint exact dates for some of this stuff. It wasn't recorded very well, or the documentation just isn't there. Behind the scenes, we didn't really get a good look or a good recorded um, history of what actually happened. So based on that, most of these um, things that we're bringing up in Milestones are generally acceptable ideas based on word of mouth or what has been documented. And the first one dates back to the arcades uh, being Pong. It turns out Atari's previous game, Computer Space, in 1971 was actually the first game with sound, but it was Pong that really changed the direction of the game industry. Yeah, if it's not obvious, Pong, the name comes from the sound. Pong. So, I mean, that, they, they were thinking about how to kind of incorporate audio into the name and, and draw people into this interactive experience. The initial version actually didn't have sound, but the designer was thinking like, oh, okay, how do, I, how do we go about adding some more elements to this to make it more interactive? And what he did was he got an amplified speaker, connected one of the ground wires uh, to the board and another to another pin that gave him the best audio possible. And that was kind of the birth of audio in games, that small little innovation. So let's listen to how that sounded. Exciting stuff. <laughs> Very primitive, but great. So. We skip ahead to 1975. Tidal releases Gunfight in the arcades. Uh, we get sound effects and a short melody from Chopin's Funeral March. This one's incredible. So the next year, Atari comes back in, in 1976 in arcades with Breakout, which is basically a single-player Pong. It featured rhythmic tones, creating one of the first times game was synchronized between sound and music. So it's part of the gameplay. This game might look familiar to some people. <laughs> that could go on for like three more minutes. But, um, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll spare you. So, 1977 was a big year for the industry. Uh, Atari released the VCS, or the Atari 2600, which sold really, really well. Unlike the Magnavox Odyssey, uh, the 2600 was the first system to offer interchangeable game cartridges and dedicated sound hardware, which meant you could have a wider range of games and uh, developers could experiment with new ways of engaging the player. The 2600 wasn't that impressive with the audio and the audio department, with only one pulse channel and one noise channel, but allowed game developers to create basic sounds with their games and um, create music that was at least engaging enough for people to enjoy the experience. We have a clip here from Combat, which was one of the Atari 2600 release titles. Take a listen. <laughs> That 
that was a lot louder than I expected. Um, <laughs> We recorded all these videos beforehand, and we weren't sure how the audio would sound, so hopefully we didn't blow out your Well, hey, drums. you got two sounds at the same time. That's yeah, pretty good. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> and that first shot was very lucky. So the Atari 2600 uses um, these pitched tones for bullets and the noise for the engine rumbling around. Basic, rudimentary, but pretty cool. All right. So in 1978, we're back in the arcades. Taito releases Space Invaders. It's pretty simple sound design, and it has a basic four-note pattern for the background music. But here's where things get interesting. There was a programming bug, and as you defeated more enemies, the intensity ramps up, and the music gets faster. Go ahead. It's making me more nervous. Yeah, it's like that very panic-inducing heartbeat right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, in 1978, we already have a game with adaptive difficulty. It gets faster as you play, and interactive music, even yeah. if it was a bit of an accident. Yeah, there's a lot going on here, a lot more going on here than just the simple tones. Because from here on out, we can start seeing how things like tempo and key changes and progressions uh, start creating atmosphere in games and become uh, allow the player to be kind of become a part of it. And uh, it was a very similar concept used in Asteroids a year later. 1980 was a huge year for arcades uh, with Namco's Pac-Man. Almost everybody knows the Pac-Man, like, worka, worka, worka. And uh, the uh, iconic bullet chomping sounds. It's almost, you get this sense of, of satisfaction running through the, the maze and, and chomping. It's almost like you can't stop. But that's how important the, the audio is to the game and what makes Pac-Man the experience that it was. Rally X was completely overshadowed by Pac-Man and Defender when it came out, but it's actually the first game to have continuous background music during gameplay. We don't have a clip here, but um, it's, uh, it's something else. It's pretty impressive. 1981 was another big year for the arcades. Frogger switches out background music as you complete levels. Donkey Kong has these kind of cinematic experiences where it goes through this whole progression of, you know, Donkey Kong swiping the princess and climbing up and this really nice experience with different jingles. Galaga did the same, the same kind of thing, really great jingles and startup chimes and bonus and level and stuff like that sound effects. It really doesn't take long for the influence of games to go beyond just the arcades. Now, we go back a few years, and in 1978, we have the band YMO, or Yellow Magic Orchestra from Japan. They sampled early arcades and consoles in their song Computer Games. Now, YMO was a huge innovator in pop and electronic music in Japan, and they influenced the sound of many, many early Japanese video game composers. Go back and listen to their albums and listen to their music, and you'll hear the influence immediately. Now, on the other side, in the U.S., we have the song Pac-Man Fever. Unfortunately. Yeah, well, <laughs> you listen to it now, it's not so great, but in uh, 1981, it sold 1.2 million copies just for the single, enough that they put it on a compilation album with a bunch of other songs about arcade games, it was a cheap cash-in, but hey, you don't sell 1.2 million copies if games aren't a big deal, right? <laughs> so back on the game side, in 1981, Tose released Vanguard in the arcades, and this is a significant one. It was one of the first games to use digital voice, to so get this really like rah, 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 voice, but at the time it was impressive, and you can actually make out some of those sounds. It was also one of the first games to use licensed music, and so this is, this is actually really cool. Let's take a listen to this clip. On Voyage. So, um, yeah, if you, if you recognize some of those tunes, uh, the first one on there is uh, Star Trek, the motion picture. It's the theme of Star Trek. And then the next one's Flash Gordon, we get the, the bonus. And those were both really early examples of licensed music in games. Journey Escape was released on the 2600 in 1982. And this, this was interesting because it was the first time a high profile band, Journey, was squeezed into the video game space. It includes music from some of their hits. And, uh, we're going to spare you from playing a clip because it's pretty awful, and the game is really bad. But it's important to, uh, to kind of note in history. We have one more stop in the early arcades here. <laughs> yeah, so finally, in the early arcades, we want to bring up Gyrus, uh, released by Konami in 1983. By this point, arcades were huge, and companies were trying to think of ways to cash in on gamers' you know, money, and so they were trying to think, like, what can we do? We need better graphics, better sound, better gameplay. Gyrus had all three. It was 
revolutionary, literally pun intended, you moving around in a circle. And uh, Konami threw in five sound chips for this and an extra processor just to uh, give it this really big sound. And with that, we get this dance electronic version of Box Toccata and Fugue in D minor. Yeah, every time I watch that clip, it's so cool. <laughs> so, you're on the next side. Okay, in the 70s and early 80s was a period of rapid growth in arcades and home consoles, but games have been around for about 10 years now, and people wanted more. They didn't just want bigger and better arcades, they wanted to bring that experience home. And for that, a new wave of hardware was coming that would push the boundaries of graphics and sound. Just kidding. If you had a PC in the early 80s, you got nothing, basically. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it was a business machine. It had really, really primitive sound hardware. You got a single square wave channel, on off, no volume control, that's it. You mostly heard this when you started up your computer when there were errors, which was a lot in those days. And of course, some composers were pretty clever even with some really limited hardware restrictions. So we have an example from 1984 uh, with the game Alley Cat. published by IBM, too. That's crazy. <laughs> so moving back a few years in 1979, the game industry was graced with a dedicated sound chip. And this was the AY38910, uh, the same chip to use in Gyrus. It was a programmable sound generator, or a PSG. And this chip and variants uh, of it were ubiquitous to games and um, pretty much everything in the mid mid-80s. It was in the Intellivision, the Atari ST, Sega Master System, MSX, arcades, pinballs. It was just used everywhere. And one of the reasons why it was so popular, there's, there's two main points. One is that the sound was pretty good. And the second is that it was cheap. And everybody likes cheap stuff, especially um, companies that have to mass produce these things. So the chip itself had three square waves, three different voices for square waves, and uh, one noise channel. This doesn't seem like a lot, but the chip was both flexible and versatile, which made the, a very strong option for developers at the time. We have two examples here using the same chip, but on two different systems. The earlier example comes from Snafu on the, uh, in television uh, in 1981, which is basically like Snake. Short loop, but it's nice. Yeah, and in, uh, so five years later, in 1986, we got Penguin Adventure by Konami on the MSX, and it's a much later game, but it's still using basically the same sound hardware. One thing we love about this is just seeing how far composers go with the same chip, how much they learn, and that experience grows over time to what they can produce.
pretty much up until the 90s, all games were just adorable. <laughs> so, some of you might recognize this machine. After the PSG chip, we have the Commodore 64, which had the SID chip in it, or the sound interface device. While the PC and Macintosh were huge in the US, the Commodore 64 was the home computer in most of Europe. It's still very fondly remembered. Released in 82 and sold until 94, it was one of the best-selling computer models of all time. And the C64 introduced many young musicians and programmers to music and sound and, and computing, actually. Yeah. The SID chip, designed by Robert Yanes, and is still considered one of, the best, one of the best sound chips of the 8-bit era. And unlike the PSG that we heard just a minute ago, this chip was a full synthesizer. It was very capable. It had programmable analog filters, multiple waveforms, more than just the square waves, and it had pulse width modulation. Long story short, this is a very capable chip, and uh, a lot of people were able to do some really, really cool stuff with it. So we're going to play two examples. First, Commando, which is a port of the earlier arcade game. It uses the theme of the original, but turns it into a totally new song.
We also have a sample from Myth, um, and this was um, 1989. And by this time, composers had started to learn the sound hardware and the techniques and what you could do with it. And it doesn't stop there. It goes even to you know 2019, they're still playing with it. But here's an example um, that we want to show that uses a lot of new filtering and stuff that was learned around this time. We could talk about video game audio without bringing up the Nintendo Entertainment System. Yeah, released in Japan in 1983 and the US in 1985, it wasn't just successful, it was a phenomenon, cultural phenomenon. And it sold 60 million units and really made the game industry pay attention. So it had some pretty modest sound hardware, but more voices than the last one. You have two pulse waves, which is kind of like those square waves that you heard earlier, a little bit more capable. A uh, triangle channel, which people typically used for bass. Uh, a noise channel, which we use for sound, like sound effects and percussion. And a sample channel, so you could record small little short samples and then uh, play those in the game. If you look at all these, all five of these channels, you notice one thing, it's, it is kind of organized like a band, right? They, they, Nintendo was conscious about this decision. They're thinking like, okay, how can we add each role and make it easier for programmers and developers to get like a real band sound out of it. And that was by giving it assigned roles. And so in this next example here, we were talking earlier, you know, game audio didn't start with Mario, but it did set the bar and change the way that we perceive a lot of game audio today. And a lot of things were built on the shoulders of the soundtrack. So let's start with um, a track from Mario. This is Underwater. Koji Kondo, the composer of Mario, he had to think about so many different things to make the player really engaged, really feel like they're part of the experience as it progresses, as you progress as a player. And it paints a picture for the industry on how game audio should start curving. And it's something that's really integral to the experience. And turning it off is like turning off a sense. If you try to play Mario without the audio, I guarantee it's just not as fun. And it, you probably not do so well at it if, you, if you're an old school gamer, I guess. So um, this next clip here, though, we just heard a track from Mario. This next one is Journey to Silius. 
which came out five years later. And um, the same sound hardware, but the composer, Kodaka, he uses the sound hardware a little bit different than we just heard. So game sound's been getting progressively better, right? So what's it, what is coming around the corner here? The next thing that's coming around is FM synthesis or frequency modulation. So maybe you've never heard of FM synthesis, maybe you have, but the technology powering it owes its success a lot to this next piece of hardware, and it's not a game. The DX7 keyboard. This is the coolest ad ever. Yeah, we, we got it from Retro Synth Ads. So back in the early 80s, when this thing came out, every big artist in the 80s wanted it. It's synonymous with the 80s synth sound. Turn on the radio station to a classic station, you will hear it. Within the first minute. Pretty much. So, Danger Zone by Kenny Loggins. Uh, What's Love Got to Do With It by Whitney Houston. Pretty much everywhere. Uh, the technology's been around since the mid-70s, but it took a while for it to take off commercially. But one of the best things is frequency modulation can make some pretty cool sounds. Yeah, the theory is that with the right algorithms, you can approximate any instrument. This didn't, this wasn't always the case. And a, a lot of people tried really hard to make a certain instrument and it ended up sounding fake. But the theory is you could just make anything you wanted. So after the su success of the DX7, Yamaha started to make lower cost versions of these FM chips. And again, like the PSG, they put them in everything. Cheap kids pianos, maybe you had one, I did. Uh, arcades, game systems like the Sega Genesis, computer sound cards. Basically, you- Everywhere and anywhere. Anywhere and everywhere, yeah. So we have two examples here, both using the same chip, the YM2151. This first example is from Marble Madness, the first game to use FM synthesis. And the second example is just a few years later from Sega in 1986, <laughs> OutRun. Some of you might recognize this game. It was a huge, huge game in arcades. You actually sat down to the steering wheel and you know, got to select your music and drive through various coastal areas. Really awesome. Here's that same chip making a lot more different sounds. Get ready. So I purposely wasn't driving here so that you could actually hear the music. <laughs>
so we don't have time to uh, have other FM examples. We really want to, but low on time. So the Sega Genesis, um, Japanese home computers like the PC-98, PC-88, all that stuff, we talk about so much on our, our podcast that uh, if you want to learn more and if you want to hear more, uh, we're big fans. A lot of, um, I, I see a few guys are also big fans in the, yeah, I know, uh, big fans of FM synthesis and game audio. So you can check us out there if you want to hear a little bit more. FM is great, and it holds a special place in all of our hearts from that 90s era. Yeah. Now... After that, we get to the era of sampling. So if you're not familiar, a sampler is basically a device that allows you to record music from anything, you know, a musical instrument or, you know, speaking, whatever, and then play it back in a musical fashion. So this opened up huge possibilities for creative uses of sound in music, and it's a hallmark of hip-hop and rap to this day. Now, dedicated samplers in the mid-'80s were really, really expensive. We're talking many thousands of dollars in you know, those days. Like, so it's now like $7,000. Yeah. So uh, as you've seen already, this existing technology was sort of miniaturized or made simple and used in game consoles and was a, a simpler and more cost-effective way for game composers to explore new ways of making music. Enter the Commodore Amiga in 1985, the follow-up to the C64, the Commodore 64. The Amiga was a very popular early multimedia computer and was used in media production environments for quite a few years. Yeah, the Amiga is essentially a four-channel sampler. Uh, it was flexible, powerful. It was a little bit strange. You had two channels that were hard panned to the left and two that were hard panned to the right. But there was so much that composers can do and also just independent amateur artists that wanted to experiment and play with new sound. So the Amiga was also the birth of a new type of music composition program called a tracker. The first trackers didn't sell very well, but hackers figured out how to make low-cost clones, and this kind of thing took off. Yeah, this image might not make a lot of sense, uh, but programs like this were really, really popular and cost-effective solutions for amateurs that didn't have all the money to pay these for the or these high and uh, you know audio workstations, and uh, like professional professional studios had. And they were ported to a variety of different systems, making music, making music composition for games in the late 80s, early 90s, a lot more easy and a lot more accessible. If you look at the, the image here, each of the four blue columns is essentially a set of instructions, and each sample channel has um, its own instruction for what instruments should be played and for how long. And since most of these notes are just reiterated samples, the same set over and over, the music could be compact enough to fit on a diskette and uh, maintain a decent level of fidelity. Yeah, so this is not really an audio recording the way you'd think of like a wave or an MP3. It's like a digital file that basically says, play this. Play at, this know, here. Yeah. Now, we get to the Super Nintendo a few years later, which was another sample-based system similar to the Amiga, but it came out a few years later, so it had better audio capabilities. By this point, sampling was pretty well understood, and Nintendo also shipped development kits with sample libraries so people could jump into composing pretty quickly. Now, the SNES had eight sample channels compared to the Amiga's four, but it still only had 64 kilobytes of audio RAM, meaning these samples had to be really short. Yeah, just like the NES, the Super Nintendo sold really well, and Nintendo's technical influence can't be understated. The uh, catalog of high-quality games on with great soundtracks on both the NES and the Super NES are some of the most well-loved examples and most remembered examples from uh, early history. So it's something that um, we have to really embrace and kind of preserve as we, um, as we move forward in game time. So we have two examples here, one from the Amiga and one from the Super Nintendo. And they're about five years apart, which is about the interval we've been doing. But, right. Uh, this, is, this is Shadow of the Beast on the Amiga uh, from 89.
This next one here is from Final Fantasy III, which was released on the Super Nintendo in 94. Square was putting out gold as far as audio was concerned, and everything that they put out is really well remembered today. This one is a, a really great track, and I think it demonstrates some good um, selection of audio samples on the Super Nintendo. You can hear the clarity is a lot, a lot crisper on this. It still sounds very gamey because the samples have to be so short, um, but it's, it's really, really pretty, very beautiful. did have some recording of the battle there afterwards, but by the late 80s, we have all of these different competing diff ways to make music, and it wasn't really that easy to make games if you had to have three different audio hardware s configurations. So industry was looking for ways to make you know, reduce the cost that you had to deal with if you needed to know sampling and FM synthesis and you know, old chips. So we start to see... Uh, this standardization of music, yeah. yeah. So enter sound cards and MIDI on home PCs in the late 80s and early 90s. Maybe you've heard of MIDI. Uh, for some of you, it means really cheap sounding music. But really, MIDI is actually just a set of instructions, just like those you saw on those Amiga trackers. And by the mid 90s, most PCs supported MIDI natively, even the Sony PlayStation ship with MIDI capabilities. And even though MIDI was standardized in 83, it continues to be used to control music interfaces and all those sorts of things today. So I took this screenshot of uh, the same file opened up in two different pieces of software. One in DOS and <laughs> from 1990, and the other one from uh, an application that's from you know, 2019. Same file, you can load it in up in both places and play it back. Yeah, you might notice the, the name of this file is canyon.mid. If you're a big Windows, uh, what is it, Windows 95? That was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's that audio the file. The super nerds will know this one. Yeah.
All right, so Doom defined first-person shooters and probably the most influential game of all time. In terms of audio, we have two examples here to demonstrate um, just how different the different sound capabilities were and what they were doing and what they were starting to lean towards at the time. So this first one, this first sample here is from the FM version or the ad lib version of Doom. So this is that older technology. And the second example is using the state-of-the-art MIDI module. Um, this is a roll-in version, so let's take a listen to that. Of course, MIDI had its limitations, and uh, there was a lot of other ways that game developers were wanting to introduce new ways to get better audio and better quality in their games. So hopefully everybody here knows what a CD is. Otherwise, we're going to feel really, really, old. really old. So yeah. <laughs> most of us have probably ditched our collections, but CD technology was a huge revelation for games at the time. So as we mentioned, we talked about it. Early games had to be very small. They had to fit on a, you know, a floppy disk or a cartridge, you know, maybe a few megabytes at most. Now, consoles started adding CD-ROM drives, which gave you all this extra data that you could play with. You had a lot more space. So you weren't just limited by the small storage. Once you had the game, you pretty much had the rest to do what you wanted with for the audio. And the music was a huge leap forward. So here's some early examples that have some pretty great music. On the console side from 1989, we have a game called Ease, released by Falcom. And uh, here we go. Now, you'll notice that other screenshot here on the right. So on the PC, Myst was one of the best-selling PC games for almost a decade, if you can believe that. Uh, it ushered in a new era of CD games that appealed to a wider audience, and the music played a big part in that.
So we've certainly come a long way, haven't we? Now, what is all this building towards? Dynamic music in video games. Think back to that example of Space Invaders in 1978. Developers realized very early how powerful interactive music could be to the gaming experience. And by the 90s, we've reached a point where games can make some pretty cool sounds, and with some clever programming, we can do interesting things with interactivity to make the games even more engaging. So. Interactivity and dynamic music is really, really what gives games their power. It's not, now we're not just talking about the level of trying to imitate film. We have a totally new dimension we can play with. So our final two examples here, we're going to play a bit of gameplay footage uh, from two different games that demonstrate interactive music. In 1991, Monkey Island 2 was released by LucasArts, and it was the first game to use their iMuse system, developed by Peter McConnell. It's a dynamic system that made transitions between music tracks more seamless. So listen to this initial theme right here. Yeah, we're in a shipyard. Listen to the, the groundwork and the instruments that's being used. So pay attention to what happens when you walk into the building. So we can see that the, the bottom of the track the percussion kind of dropped off, and this new melody is layered on top. It's like this nice vertical alignment. A very seamless transition, very cool. So we're back out to the city. Percussion comes back. <laughs> There's one more example here we want to show. Such a great soundtrack. Love that one. Uh, so in 1998, we have Banjo Kazooie, which takes real time that real time transition of audio to the next level and fully realized 3D. Seamless transitions started making games a lot more enjoyable. It made it feel like you were driving the music and the audio. So, of course, we've seen a lot of development up to this point, and obviously, a lot has changed since that time. It's been 20 years since that clip from 1998, uh, 21 now, but the things that we've covered, the sort of pushing the boundaries, the idea of interactive audio, has really laid the foundations for what makes games what they are today and you know will continue to inform games for many years to come. We have this game Cuphead which pulls very heavily from old animation traditions of the 1930s. It's a really cool game with an awesome big band soundtrack. We have great new games that are experimenting with art and color and interactivity in you know brand new ways like Grease here. Uh, we were actually able to talk to the composers for both of these first two games and of course if you're a big gamer we have things like Red Dead Redemption 2, which almost looks photorealistic. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, and surprisingly, it has amazing interactivity in music. As, you, know, you get this nice kind of homey Western soundtrack that changes as you start galloping faster and doing different things. So um, a lot of thought was put into the music interactive part. Before we so, wrap up. Yeah, so yeah. before we wrap up, we wanted to mention um, some of the great upcoming events tonight and content this weekend. Yeah. So. You're going to be joining us, actually, uh, in the next event, hopefully, for 
Austin Wintery performing a piece with Philippe Quint, Peter Dugan, the Triforce Quartet, and a new game by Rami Ismail in real time. Yeah, there's also uh, more events tomorrow. Library of Congress Arcade from 10 to 4, uh, where you can play some of these games and experience them experience them for yourselves. Uh, A talk on game preservation at 11 by the Library of Congress where uh, they're going to discuss the steps it takes to collect, catalog, and preserve video game content. And then finally a talk by Winifred Phillips at 2 and her experiences on game composition. So we want to thank everybody for joining us today. And actually, especially, we have a lot of people joining us from various places. Yeah, Uh, so I want to say thanks. The community is huge for video game music, and it's growing. And the preservation is so awesome and important to us. And so um, a lot of our friends have joined in that do very similar things. We like to share and just have a good time. There's Rhythm and Pixels, um, Key Glyph, VG Embassy, all joining us. Craig, over here. Um, Greg Murray, and um, we're uh, we're really happy that everybody's come out to hear some amazing game music and uh, join us in the concert next door. So thank you again for joining us. We've been Pixelated Audio. If you want to find us, you can look us up at pixelatedaudio.com on Twitter, on Facebook, or contact us at that email address, contact at pixelatedaudio.com. Yep. Thank you guys very much, and uh, we'll see you at the concert. Now, we wanted to open things up just for a few minutes. Did anybody have any, like, one or two questions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I only have one answer remaining. Let's <laughs> choose wisely. I, I've been a regular attendant at the MAGFest last few years. Uh, so when I play the Game Boy uh, chiptune thing, so all the composition on, of the songs they play in there is, that, is on the Game Boy console itself or allowed to do... Or, do a lot of the mus- uh, musicians are composed on a regular keyboard? You know? Well, um, most likely, there's actually a really popular program called LSDJ. That's one of the main ones. It's very similar to that tracker thing that we showed you. You have these like lanes where you say, play this at this time. That's one of the most common ones that Game Boy musicians use. They like There's a cartridge that some guy made that you can basically play it like a game and use it to write music directly onto the thing. Yeah, we see that more and more um, as people become kind of nostalgic for these these um, systems like the Game Boy, that they want to recreate, um, authentically recreate the sound, and so they come up with various ways to record from an actual Game Boy, or an ax- actual Sega Genesis, or a PC-98, or a Nintendo, and um, be able to produce the sound that way, rather than just playing through a keyboard. You know, to follow along with that, one of the things, one of the reasons why chiptune as a genre really came about is exactly the thing we've, talk- we've talked about. All of these systems are old now. They're cheap. You can buy them for almost nothing. They have great sound capabilities. So people are like, well, if you're just going to throw it away, I might as well use it to start making music. And that's really what it's been about. I mean, initially, it's, it's grown so much. Yeah, I mean, chiptune has become sort of its own subculture of music where people use these very like retro-sounding sound chips to make new music today. Um, I wanted to ask something about more, something more modern, actually. Um, do you have any information about a more modern setting? If you have, a, if you have say, an orchestra playing your, your music for your soundtrack, <laughs> how would that... How would that technologically differ from using, say, a, a sample? Like, because you're going to, you're probably not going to get through your whole track necessarily in any given moment. You're going to modulate it. How would that differ from just using, say, a sampler to create your music? Well, we've actually talked to um, a few composers that had a lot of things to say about the same thing. I think it was Chris Madigan, uh, who did Cuphead, actually, who mentioned that he wanted to do, sam- he wanted to sample some of the instruments, but he ended up turning to the, the live band to record most of it because he was able to get the best timbre out of that, that authentic, that real live band sound. Whereas the sample, you know, it could, it, you could push it and make it do a lot of things, but it didn't quite get close to what his vision was. So I think it comes down to the composer and what they want. Yeah, and with a sample, sometimes you're just limited. If you only have a few, they'll all sound kind of the same. Whereas if you record an entire band, there'll be you know, minor differences between the way that they're playing one passage versus another. So I, I think to answer your question, sometimes sampling is actually the better way and people use sample libraries to play back this you know, MIDI data or whatever and modulate in real time. Other times they'll just have full tracks. If this is just 
the band, or this is just the guitarist playing, and then they will use these, sometimes it's called a stem, which is sort of sections, and they'll switch those stems out. It's a similar kind of process to what you're seeing, but with you know, much bigger budgets, higher audio processing capabilities. And I think also the imperfections that you get from live audio are very, very hard to replicate with samples. It's, it's just too hard to recreate those, those minor mistakes and those minor nuances that you get from a live recording. Yeah, it's about 7.20. I think we have a few minutes. Uh, I think they're planning on starting around, around 7.30, right? Or is 8. Okay, great. Okay, uh, great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you. So how about that, Brian? Uh, hopefully our listeners learned a few things. We learned a few things. We learned a lot, actually. You know, there's... We, we talk about so many different things on the on the show and in, in general um, we really dig into you know specific composers and companies but looking at something in a very broad view you know looking at game audio over the last 50 years kind of opened up my eyes to systems that I kind of you know I pass by like especially the Intellivision right yeah like, doing the research for this show really made me realize there was actually some pretty good music for how early it was in the history I, of game audio I had an Intellivision I don't remember hardly anything from it and going through this we you know we were picking out a lot of stuff that we thought would be fun we didn't want to go too obscure because we just thought we'd lose everybody um, but some of the stuff like like snafu that was so fun to play the game and get those those audio clips and I, we just had a f fun time putting that kind of stuff together yeah and the shortest way of saying it is that we've got a lot of great ideas for new shows coming up just doing all this research put a lot of things on our radar that we hadn't even been thinking about yeah and we got to meet a lot of new people so after our talk was a concert that was put together by austin wintory he composed a new piece and uh it was an interactive experience with the audience where Rami Ishmael actually put together a game for this. You might know his work from like Loof Trousers, something an indie title, and a really nice guy. And the game was um, a piece that was, it was almost like an interactive painting, right? Where the audience, everybody in the audience could use their phone to make very small but subtle changes to the, the painting or to the game. And this kind of dynamic music would be played as the you know as the painting was changing and it was such a clever idea it executed pretty well i think and there was a few things that we were hoping there was a um was it a Loch Ness monster? No. There was a kraken that oh. would have showed up if at six minutes they had been in sort of one state versus the other. Right, right. So some of the audience could go to the left or they can go to the right. Nobody knew what others were doing. It was just this really kind of nice organic chaos that was really fun. And and the performers, like the, the violin, the piano, the music, they had to adjust based on looking at what the popular um, directions were and change their mood of the music on the fly, which was, it was really fun. It was just a, something that hadn't been done before. And I think it was a, a fun experience. Yeah. The piece was somewhat non-linear. You can think of like branching paths. So they played it three times. The first time was sort of like the normal path. And then as people would interact with it, they would be looking at these screens and whichever was the predominant direction, uh, left or right, whichever one was winning, that was kind of where the path would fork. So like, you couldn't actually hear all of the music that was written for the performance. You'd maybe only hear about 40% of it, which was kind of a cool idea. And I think it was probably very stressful for the performers right, right, who were right. having to play it. Yeah, but it was it was a blast. And we'll post some pictures of Gene and I backstage with like Awesome Wintery and Rami Ishmael and stuff. It was it was so much fun. It was I was it was an out of body experience for me. It was just such such a fun thing to be a part of. Yeah, and shout out to the Triforce Quartet for putting on a really great set. They actually put on uh, three different medleys in between the various performances. They had one with uh, Tetris music, they had a Final Fantasy medley, and the third one was Zelda. Right. Yeah, so they did a really fantastic job, and the whole concert program was just we even got up and spoke on the stage you know yeah. it was it was very we had to wing it a little bit they kind of gave us a little bit of a talk backstage yeah. this is kind of how things are going to go and we're like mm -hmm, yeah okay yeah <laughs> but we, we still just kind of made it up as we went along <laughs> it was a lot of fun yeah uh, it was a lot of fun i mean you know we got to make a lot of new friends out of it uh fellow podcasters um you heard them in the last episode 
and uh, also uh, Rhythm Pixels, who didn't get to record with us, but we got to meet them for the first time. That was a lot of fun. Um, again, Austin Winery, Rami Ismail, Winifred Phillips. Uh, was- she gave a fantastic talk on interactive audio. It was mm-hmm. just an absolute... We have a photo with her, so maybe we'll post that somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it was funny because a lot of her talk with interactivity really aligns with our talk that we just that you just heard uh as we got into the monkey island stuff and uh, banjo kazooie and stuff like that. it was it was really great to see that you know like we're all on the same page and our talk kind of led right into all of this stuff and I, and I think it worked out really well yeah uh we'll be putting up a slide deck along with this show and when we can find a link to it we'll also post a link to winifred's talk and you'll see that we sort of dovetail directly into what she's talking about, which is great. We even kind of end on one of the same examples that she uses, you'll see. <laughs> yeah. So we want to say thanks to David Plyler and Solomon Solo Hail Selassie, who were gracious enough to invite us to take part in this event. Uh, it was a kind was, of a, a life goal, I guess. It was a tremendous honor. Like when we first got the email, we didn't even know if it was for real because who would contact us to go to talk in DC? Oh man, we got so much spam that comes in that we have to filter out. And I was like, Library of D- Library of Congress, no king, you know. Like, Brian, Brian, read this. I think this is this is for real. Yeah, <laughs> and it was. And it, was, and it, it was. was amazing. But you know what? the The big win here is that for us it was a lot of fun. But the, I think the big win is for video game music and the fact that it's being recognized as a real type of music, you know, where it's just been passed by for so many years in its infancy, and then as you know, time goes on and we get into bigger and more, um, you know, nostalgia based kind of, um, scores that people are just, you know, reminiscing about and all this stuff, it's, it's becoming this, just this massive community. And, um, and I think that's really the most powerful thing about the, the whole talk and about the whole event. Yeah. And you have people that are rediscovering all this classic music too, in addition to all of the great game music that's coming out today. I mean, we, sort of saw the the future of that, you know, listening to a lot of these talks and music about interactive music. And we've had all these great composer interviews from back in the day, and even a few from more recently, and just seeing the whole, and seeing the whole continuum of what's possible in game audio has just been such a great joy. And and it's really, I say this a lot, but it's really why we love doing the show. Right. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed the talk. We are going to be back on our regularly scheduled programming uh, just what a week or so when we get the next episode out and then you can expect the, the normal thing from us. Sorry for the delay. Uh, I know we had like a good long break from Gabriel Knight uh, to this, but we were in DC giving a talk. So maybe you can forgive us this time. <laughs> and the talk will be up officially on the library of Congress, uh, website, YouTube, a few other places in a few months. Uh, if you're really desperate to see us on video, but we should have most of our own materials up you know, the slide deck and this recording pretty soon. So you'll be listening to it before it's available there, but it will be there for many years to come. Maybe after our website is no longer up. (laughs) Yeah. Unless we get pegged for some weird copyright infringement that we didn't take into account. But I think, I think we're safe. I think so. Anyways, thank you guys so much for listening and we'll see you back in a few weeks for the next episode.